greetings, old school magic players, and welcome to the Four Horsemen. Thank you for joining us today, old school magic players. We have the pleasure of being joined by Vian Weissman, the legendary old school magic player, and we'll be covering the Four Horsemen Old School Magic Tournament number two finals. Four Horsemen Old School Magic Tournament number two was a four week regiment that ran from August 6th through September 3rd. As a quick recap for our viewers, the Four Horsemen Old School Magic format focuses on the original first four expansion sets of Magic the Gathering, Arabian Nights, Antiquities, Legends, and the Dark. The banned and restricted list is as you see here. Our tournament number two champion will be receiving this unique Ken Meyer Jr. Guardian Beast Purple Moonlight Playmat. The Four Horsemen and Ken Mayer Jr. had only 100 of these custom, unique art Guardian Beast playmats printed. They're signed and numbered by Ken Mayer Jr. We have a few of these playmats left. If you're interested, visit fourhorsemanmagic.com. If you would like to play Four Horsemen Old School Magic, please join us every Thursday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for our weekly meetup and battle royale. Join us for camaraderie, conversation, casual games, and deck testing where proxies are always allowed. Meet us at facebook.com slash groups slash four horsemen MTG. In our prior videos, Brian Weissman and Zachatzer have been covering tournament number two semifinals. Philippe emerged victorious over Chadster in 2-0. And on our last video, Parker Boab faced off with John Eckleberry and emerged victorious with a 2-1 win. In today's video, Brian Weissman and the Chadster will be covering the Four Horsemen Old School Magic Tournament number two finals. Philippe Vizian faces off with Parker Boab. For this finals match, we have two very interesting, different and competitive Old School Magic deck builds. Philippe Bizian is running his blue green skies aggro deck, while Parker Boab is running his blue workshops robots deck. And now, the moment you've all been waiting for. Let's go to the finals! All right, it's been almost six months in the making, but we are here at last. The Four Horsemen Old School Magic Tournament Number Two Finals. I'm Brian Weissman. I'm here with my good friend, the Chadster, and we're going to be covering our finals matchup between two titans of the format. We have uh, Philippe Bizion versus Parker Boab. These two guys have navigated a uh, quarterfinal bracket. I've actually been pretty much mowing down their opponents, and uh, it should be quite an action-packed finale. And it's definitely a very interesting kind of clash of styles. Uh, Philippe, as I mentioned before in previous uh, previous videos, is playing a uh, pretty aggressive blue-green assortment. He's running a really nice mana curve of aggressive creatures in, uh, in the form of one-drops of both Flying Men and Elves of Deep Shadow, ramping up into more powerful finishers, including a set of four Serendib Afrites, four Serendib Jins, and even a pair of Serendib Jins alongside uh, some additional support in the form of bounce counters and unstable mutations. He's even got a little bit of main deck artifact killed around at the deck and some card advantage in the form of Sylvan Library. Uh, his opponent, Parker, is playing what is widely considered to be the most dominant archetype in the format. That's certainly been borne out not just by this tournament, but also the previous tournament and then subsequent tournaments as well. Workshops, dreaded workshops, uh, which is... A bit ironic, actually, given the fact that um, when, when Chad, as far as I know, first set out to build this format, he was looking for a uh, an alternative to a format that was dominated by workshops. And <laughs> he was the architect of a format where workshops was clearly the uh, the best overall archetype. Yeah, was, life life is full of these uh, interesting ironies, is it not? Yeah, these <laughs> ironic twists. Although, um, 
Workshops is interesting. You know, it's it's a very, very straightforward deck. I would say that Shops is probably one of the most straightforward decks in regular old school, but because of the constraints of four horsemen and the fact that you don't have access to alpha, you're left to uh, have to do a little bit more innovation and play with some cards that don't see a lot of play in regular Shops. And um, I think foremost among those, Triskelion and, and uh, Suchi obviously see a ton of play in regular old school Shops, but you don't see Tetravis very often. And you don't see cards like Jalen Tome played very often uh, and often, and uh, Millstone as well. So Parker's got a couple of interesting innovations in here. He is running three copies of Recall in his decks to uh, sort of churn and utilize uh, the big artifacts multiple times. A lot of people have opted for more uh, kind of compact alternatives to that effect in the form of Draftness Restoration or even Reconstruction. And uh, Parker's gone with a Recall route. He is running four copies of Transmute Artifact, which is one of the other kind of backbones of this deck that you don't normally see played in, in uh, old school versions of shops. And he's got a couple of interesting support cards. I did mention that he's running uh, Jalem Tome. In fact, he's got four copies of Jalem Tome, which is uh, an interesting innovation, but allows him to churn past redundant copies of Recall or Transmute Artifact or whatever. Maybe, um, you know, if his opponent is not playing with Arabian Nights, he can throw his city in a bottle. And, uh, and he has this other interesting innovation of running three main deck copies of Relic Barrier, which a lot of people associate as being more of a sideboard card to kind of deal with workshops but given the fact that misha's work uh misha's factory is played in this format and is quite commonly used in most designs the uh the relic bearers at least have some utility there i'm going to get to the sideboards real quick um because they're certainly going to play a role in this matchup you'll notice actually on philippe's uh spell ground he's he's actually put uh, when we get to the games he's put four copy uh four cards from his sideboard directly into play to uh, taunt and menace his opponent. <laughs> There's four copies of Energy Flux featured very prominently on Philippe's battlefield. I think, I think they're, adorn the, throughout... they're, they're adorning the corners of his mat. Yeah, and it seems like proper adornment given how incredibly potent and powerful that effect is in this matchup. And in fact, I would go so far as to say that if a single copy of Energy Flux resolves early in the game, and it could resolve as early as turn two, uh, it it puts the screws on Parker's deck so hard that he, he's going to be hard-pressed to actually figure out a way around it. Because... Yeah. Workshop can ramp out a big monster, but you're not going to win the game if you're paying two mana per everything that you have in play. Right. And he's got a million cards that are affected by it. Felwarstone, of course, makes half of the mana, uh, or actually you know, a negative minus one mana if there's energy flux in play. You're never going to utilize a millstone. You're not going to be able to utilize a Jalen's home. It's four mana a turn to just cycle a card. It's so crippling and backbreaking uh, that it's probably a single copy would be almost decisive, certainly two of them would mean the game is effectively over. And that's why I think Philippe is flexing so hard with them. Um, as far as assessing the the relative strength of these decks against each other, it's really, really hard to say. I'd actually uh, be curious to hear your feedback on this. Other than the the four energy fluxes, it doesn't really, doesn't seem to me that either player really has anything that stands out as being particularly decisive. Philippe is running three main deck crumbles and he does have a fourth copy in his sideboard. So that'll that'll certainly be coming in. But Parker doesn't really have a lot of cards that make a lot of sense in this matchup. He does have four remove soul, but the problem is, is that Philippe has so many creatures that are low to the ground and small. And if you draw a couple of remove souls early, you're probably not going to want to remove soul on a flying man or a Wailulu wolf or an elves of deep shadow. So the card's just going to sit in your hand while you wait for something bigger to come along. And meanwhile, the guy's just bashing you for two or three damage a turn. So I don't really see remove souls being particularly good. Dan Dan. Not bad, but most of the creatures are either too big or they fly right over that, so it's not really that good of an alternative. Flash counter, again, not so useful because you're not going to be fighting stack battles. And, of course, the uh, the uh, um, Flash Flood's totally useless against him. He doesn't have any red mana. So it looks like Parker's kind of being in a, a bad situation where he's got a lot of main deck cards that aren't good for the matchup. The Relic Barriers certainly are absolutely useless. They do literally nothing. The Millstones are close to useless. I've already talked at length about how bad Millstone is as a card in general. Jalen Tome, probably too slow. And it sort of seems to me that that Parker's deck is actually set up pretty well to, ta to take this match. Um, not only does he have a, a good mixture of aggression and bounce and disruption and stuff, but he's got those four energy fluxes in the sideboard. And I think Parker's going to be really, really hard-pressed to counteract what Philippe is doing, even in game one, much less in games two and three if they go there. Um, curious to know if you think the same, Chad. Yeah, I mean... It's a big problem for Parker, the energy fluxes and the crumbles. Um, but, you know, if he can get an early robot out, if he can get a first or second turn workshop, get something going early before uh, Philippe has time to build out his board, 
then maybe he could get an advantage. But he's also got things like the unstable mutation to deal with in the air. You know, if 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 uh, Philippe gets a Serendib with an unstable on it, I mean, it's just going to wreck Parker. Yeah, like what 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 the hell does Parker even do against that? I mean, right? his only hope then would be the Taunus Coffin. Or, yeah, exactly. You know, uh, or maybe blocking with a Tetravis and then, you know, using Triskelion to try and finish uh, with the damage. So for Parker, it's all going to be about can I get a workshop early? And um, that's only going to be for game one. For game two, I mean, like you pointed out, all he's got really that's effective is the remove souls. Um, the the uh, the flash counters could be effective against the crumbles, though, um, since crumbles an instant, uh, and he's got the main deck three main deck crumbles and one extra. Parker could theoretically put in the flash counters and try to you know thwart those crumbles as they come. The Dan Dans. Um, you know, with the Urnum Gins, unless he's got a Triskelion in play, the Dandans don't have the power to take out the Urnums and everything else flies. Yeah. So, it, you know, other than the Wild Eagles for pumping. Unlikely to be effective. I mean, obviously, we're, we know that Parker is going to have to probably pull at least six cards out of his deck and probably more because he's got a lot of things that are just, you don't want him in your hand early in the game against an aggressive deck. You don't want Jalen Tomes early. You don't want four copies of Transmute Artifact. You don't even want the recalls. So he is going to have a lot of flexibility. I guess the one saving grace that Parker has, and if he can land it early and Philippe does not have a mana drain or a crumble for it immediately, is that singular city in a bottle. Yeah. That city in a bottle. If he's gonna if he's gonna win the game with anything, it's gonna be that one card. Mm -hmm. Because if you look over at Philippe's deck, he is covered in Arabian Knights cards. In fact, yeah, nearly all of his threats are Arabian, Arabian Knights creatures. Yeah. Uh, by my count, it looks like, I don't know how many, uh, yeah, it looks like, what is that, 16, 18? 18, 18 of his creatures are, uh, no, it's 16, actually. Yeah, he's got 12 plus the additional four. Oh, I, I, the City of Brass and the and, and the and Stables, those are all. Yeah, and the Unstable Mutation and the Cities of Brass as well. So he's got upwards of, um, yeah, upwards of 20 or more cards. So a, thir a full third of his deck is annihilated by City in a Bottle. So... Parker will have a fighting chance if he can get City in a Bottle resolve and he's able to protect it. That would be another argument, actually, in favor of the Flash Counters, because if he can just leverage the City in a Bottle through those four transmutes and then just do his absolute best to protect it, even to the point of taking some extra damage, because if he's able to get City in a Bottle in play and protect it, Philippe's going to, he's not really going to have any way to close out the game. And he doesn't have any direct damage at all. There's no Sonic Blast in the format or anything, which means that even if he's at literally one life, Parker could could potentially win the game by just sticking city in a bottle and protecting with flash counter and mana drain so that may in fact be his strategy yeah. going into game two and game three we'll see if it pans out that way of course but um as far as sideboarding is go from well, well we'll get to that when we get to games uh game two and potentially game three as well i'd like to just hop right into the games and see how it goes do you have a prediction chad about who's going to take this and be the uh tournament number two grand champion um i'll keep my i know the results so and this is one of the matches where i i remember <laughs> okay how, how it turned out so i'll keep my i'll keep my opinions to myself and, and wish both players good luck all right i'll make a prediction i i would say that philippe is is considerably favored in the matchup one thing you have to always assess is if you were to look at sort of the average draw from these two decks and how they stack up the average draw from philippe's deck is going to beat the average draw from parker's deck and in fact parker's going to be in a situation where he needs to draw kind of the exact permutation of things while while not drawing a bunch of things in his deck whereas philippe can kind of draw any cross section of his deck and it should be very very effective in the matchup and whenever you have that situation it means that probably the the aggressive deck is going to be at least a probably three to one favorite or maybe even more and that's pre-sideboard and after sideboard with those four energy fluxes i just don't understand what parker does he can't get rid of them with the city in a bottle and even a couple of energy fluxes could keep sitting in a bottle, uh, could make him pay four mana or even six mana a turn if he got three of them in play, which would stymie his ability to even develop or counter or do anything. And uh, and that would be alone enough to for uh, Philippe to take the match. But you never really know. It's magic, right? There's lots of randomness. Could go either way. And uh, let's see how the games go. And the fact that Philippe is drawing first makes me think that he is probably going first as well. And one thing to consider, um, this is this is now changed with updates to the rules for Four Horsemen. But back in August, when this match was played, we were playing with very, very old school rules. In fact, uh, with the exception of the 
London Mulligan rule, I believe every single rule played in this format at this point in time is rules as they existed back in the in the early 1990s. So there's mana burn, uh, the stack the stack works a little bit differently, and of course uh, things like dying at the end of the at the end of a phase rather than instantaneously is another factor. It looks like um, maybe he's bringing up an app. Yeah, it looks like uh, looks like Parker's bringing up an app to keep track of life. Let's see how this goes. All right, so let's kick this off. Uh, Parker's looking at his opening seven, which I guess he already drew. We have no audio. Uh, looks like there's no mulligans. Waiting right here, I think. Okay. Oh, he's leading with strip mine. Interesting choice. This is a four strip mine format for other old school fans who are are used to playing with only one strip mine in the environment. And it was determined that there's just there's so many good lands in the format that uh, that need attention that running allowing people only a single copy of strip mine was probably not a, not a wise decision. So first turn flying man for Philippe, just about ideal. We'll see if if Parker's got a Felwar stone. Oh, sitting in a bottle. Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> How about well, that? I mean, thank, thankfully he's got three crumbles, but that's that's a death knell practically right there. If if Philippe doesn't have a crumble in hand right now, uh, I can't imagine what he's really going to be able to do. Man, talk about talk about lucky one outer right there. Mm. Not only kills the flying man, the city in a bottle is such an incredibly brutal effect that the rules committee for four horsemen ultimately decided to remove it from the format. That could be a crumble though. Oh, he's it got is. it. <laughs> he's got it. Wow. All right. Well, that's very fortunate because without a crumble early. Um, I mean, Philippe has no chance. There's literally nothing he can do. Yeah. It'd well, be interesting to see you notice. Oh, what were you saying? I was just going to say, Parker does have those three recalls, and this is probably why he can get that sitting in a bottle back multiple times if he... Yeah, very yeah, very valid point, actually. Um, yeah, so he's gained two life all that. And you wonder, does he have more land? Because he might have kept a strip mine island draw. Okay, so he's got a second island. I can't tell if he just drew that. But I was thinking he might have kept a land light hand uh, just by nature of having City in a Bottle. It looks like he's yeah. kind of fighting a strip mine. Looks like he'll be taking out the island. Interesting. What do you think about the decision to strip mine this early? Well, I mean, it's come back to haunt me many times in Four Horsemen. Um, yeah. Especially if somebody plays a strip and strips one of your lands. Um, the library, the mazes, the, the the mistress factories, even things like uh, Pendle Haven and um, uh, Island of Whack Whack, you know, all of those are really big problems. And strip mine is the only way to deal with them unless you're playing something like Blight or Desert Twister. So, yeah, uh, it's it's risky. But I mean, I don't think Philippe is is running. Um, uh library of alexandria because he's a deck is so aggressive so that's probably the right move yeah that's correct and actually uh speaking of yeah speaking of risks you saw him hesitate right there so mana drain is in this format right there's as a four of that's another big difference from old school and you'll notice that philippe thought a, a, a bit there and ultimately decided to go with sylvan library he may be holding a serendip of free and he decided not to cast it um yeah Parker, but, missed, that's a Parker missed, right? yeah, Parker missed a land drop on turn four. So it's possible that my suspicions were correct that he kept a land light hand with a strip mine in an island because he had City in a bottle, and he certainly has some foresight about his opponent's deck. Oh, looks like yeah. we're chatting with them for a second here. Um, but he did not play a land on turn four, and Philippe opted to cast Sylvan Library over possibly Cern of so that he didn't face down a five or a six. And it is interesting, though, uh, Philippe, I'm sorry, Parker has actually opted to run with some with fewer big creatures compared to some of the other shop decks. A lot of shop decks have been using not just four Tetravis, but also multiple copies of Clockwork Avian mm -hmm. at the at the five mana slot. And and uh, Parker does not have any five mana creatures. He's only running fours and sixes. So mana draining a Serendip of and having five mana on his turn isn't necessarily that big of a benefit. But he might be able to play a Suchi here off the manager and we'll, we'll have to see in a second. I don't know why I turned my camera on here. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not sure what you're actually discussing here. There's no reason for me to be on camera here. Um, yeah, we're, we're discussing something. I could try to fiddle with the volume, but um, I think it was some kind of rules question. Um, but back to that whole thing about Parker running fewer creatures, I think 
he's planning to transmute for most of whatever he wants, right? If he needs a city in a bottle, he'll transmute for it. If he needs a Triskelion, if he needs a Tetravis, he's got four transmutes, effectively four tutors. So I think he's running less of those big creatures so that he can just tutor. That's also why he's, I think, got the Relic Barriers. He can tap down Fairwash Stones. He's got the uh, Jalum Tomes. He can he can transmute those uh, to get the, the larger robots out. Yeah, I mean, I certainly touched on this when we were covering Parker's games before about how, uh, given the fact that he's running all these copies of, of um, Transmute Artifact, that he probably should not have run so many copies of the more situational artifacts like Relic Barrier and Jalen Tome and Millstone. You just don't need the same redundancy. If you really want that effect, you have it on demand, and it's probably better to just run with the stuff that's more consistent, like creatures in general. Yeah. But we'll see what he's got right here. He's, he's got two mana in his pool. He may just be throwing a Suchi into play here. And I think if I were... Okay, so he did draw another land, so he's got five mana available, but he's not playing Clockwork Avian. But we may see just Suchi come down here. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, no Suchi. All right, but... Uh, yeah, and so that uh, the Sylvan Library did not resolve. So we'll see if Philippe's got a, a Surrender Befreet in his hand. He just drew a Forest, it looks like. I think sort of flashed at the camera. I would have been a little reluctant, I think, in in Philippe's position after my opponent missed a land drop and I think had six cards in hand to uh, to have played something into potential mana drain, but it looks like he's able to just run out something that's strictly better than Suchi. Yeah, I heard him. Yeah, and that's a big Suchi. problem. Yeah, it is a, indeed a big problem for Parker. I mean, they can trade four damage each just through the forest walk ability. Right. Parker's got a, so he's drawn another land off the top. Two in a row, he's going to play another Suchi. What are you doing there, Chad? I don't know. <laughs> Get off the screen. What are you doing there? I'm, I'm, I'm hungry for screen time, apparently. <laughs> Clearly, yes. You have to make the finals in order to be in the finals. Yeah, I know. Finals. I haven't done that yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, neither have I, so don't feel too bad. Well, you were in the, yeah, you were in the finals, right? With Mesa, with Matt Mesa. Semi-finals. I lost in the semi. Oh, okay. Oh, wait, that's spoilers. That's spoilers. We'll get to that eventually. I haven't even done those games yet. That was tournament number four, right? Yeah, that was tournament four. number four. Yeah, we said. Wait, we just okay. Anybody that heard that, if you're interested in tournament number four's outcome, just <laughs> purge that from your memory. It did not happen. All right. All right. So he's untapping now. I have no idea what you're talking to him about. Do you have any recollection? Usually, usually when there's something uh, where I pop in, it's because there's a rules question, and I'm not the you know, the most exquisite experienced uh, rules aficionado, but that's usually when I jump in because I try to record these matches and um, lots of questions come up. And yeah, and so we're letting Michael, Michael Scheffenacker's joining in here. I can, I can turn on the audio real quick. Um, okay. We are in the finals uh, and we're just obsessing over a ruling here um, on Phil's pre-combat main phase okay um it was on phil's turn um phil you played what card did you play phil sylvan uh, library sylvan library you played sylvan library it's it's pre-combat main phase for phil sylvan library's cast okay. parker casts mana drain phil uh -huh. mo phil moves to his combat phase and then his post-combat main phase we just want to make sure that the mana drain that was cast by by cause slash Parker, um, it, he doesn't get the mana until Parker's turn, right? Of course, it's, Wait, it's the, it your turn. next main okay. phase. Yeah, and then your next main phase. Cast the mana drain. Yes, the mana drain on Seven Library. Can you pause for a minute here, it, Chad? Please. It's Parker's pause next video. main phase. Which pause, pause, pause. Okay, right yeah, so that's the question, Brian. Okay, I what on earth would make anybody ask that question? Well, uh, I guess Philippe, I don't know. I guess Philippe was wondering, you know, when that when he gets the two mana. I mean, the next main phase. The only reason that that matters, actually, occasionally you might be in a situation where you... Uh, where you're on your turn and you have a mana drain in your hand and you want to cast something and there's a possibility your opponent may respond by countering back. 
if you mana drain under the current rules and you do and you cast your spell before combat you will get the mana after the combat step right because that's the next main phase for the next right it's the second main but we're playing in 1994 rules and there was no such thing as a first or second main so it's a totally relevant question i think that was part of and it never worked that way regardless it's a bit bizarre to me but yeah i think it was just you really want to clarify so second suchi comes down these guys are probably just going to stare at each other for a bit although it put it does put Philippe in a bit of a bind because because he has to give force walk to one of them it means that he can either trade four for eight or just sit back and just take four over and over again yeah so it is a bit uncomfortable yeah it's so funny Ernam Jin when it was running roughshod over standard format way back in uh, 1995 when it was re- when it was printed in Chronicles mm-hmm. it was so rare that you would actually care about forest walk because everybody got green mana from all the alternate green sources like pain lands and cities and stuff okay there's two ernums so this this fun can continue he can't attack here actually it might be worthwhile to, to just send one of these in fact i think philippe should attack with one of them yeah and i've had that i've had that same situation in my games brian if i have a city of brass or a pendle haven um you know you can play ernum and the disadvantage doesn't even exist because you don't have a forest yeah, exactly. And and keep in mind, we're playing in a mana burn format, so those Suchis are not free to block with. If he blocks one of them, or double blocks here, he's going to take four points of mana burn anyway and trade one for one. So he does the right thing and probably just takes the four. And he can attack back for four. But yeah, having that second earn on was a very, very big deal because otherwise Philippe would have been in a pretty bad spot. He's really kind of weathered the storm here, but imagine if, uh, imagine if Parker has one of his three recalls in hand. And he hits a third land or a fifth land, and he can go recall for city in a bottle death instantly. Yeah. Well, that early turn, that second turn crumble uh, was very fortuitous for Phil. I mean, it was it was, it was lucky for for Parker cause to get it early. But I mean, imagine if that city in a bottle had remained in play. You know, it would have been crushing. Yeah, it's just lights out, definitely up transmuting. But he can't get city in a bottle here. He's probably going to go. So the way that this works is you get the mana after the transmute resolves. So you can't use the mana from the transmute to pay for the extra cost. I assume he's getting Triskelion here, though. Probably, yeah. That's possibly, what... possibly Tetravis. But we know it's not sitting in a bottle, and it looks like, yeah, he's paying the two. So he's going to have to figure out something to do with the four mana from the... What the hell? Why did his island go to the graveyard? Oh, um, it looks like oh, he strip minded. He strip minded, I think, in response to the yeah, transmute. Yeah, so strip minded in response. Yeah, not that that matters. He can still tap it for mana, of course. Okay, and he pays the. So he's got four mana in his pool. We'll see what he does with that. And hopefully, he doesn't just ignore it. I see him shuffling here. It would have been interesting to see him. I guess he wouldn't have transmuted a Taunus's coffin, but this this certainly shows you, and it's actually a bit ironic that um, in a way it was actually bad that he drew that city in a bottle so early because he yeah. could have transmuted for city in a bottle right there and wiped the board, right? And, yeah. and bash with uh, and bash with both Suchis. Yeah, maybe probably, I mean, it would have been. It would um, surely by now Phil would have used his crumble on something, and then he could have dropped the city. For devas, for you know, all yeah. The- well, keep in mind, it still produces the effect even if you crumble it right away. It still wraths the board for all the Arabian cards. You can't res- you can't crumble it on the stack. All right. Oh, okay. So I know I know what you're ar- you're arbitrating here. Spell it's about the four, the four generic mana. Mana. I would still get another priority to float. Yeah, yeah for sure. You, you, it's yeah. just I, I might not just be allowed to to strip mine at that particular. Yeah. Point. No, no, Phil, you are you are, but but Parker is able to tap the. Oh, yeah, that, yeah, that's yeah. not. That, that's I not think you have to do it before I start searching, like in response to the spell itself. So, like the other Suchi would still totally, be- yeah, it's totally relevant anyway. It doesn't matter at all. You yeah, can't stop the guy getting mana out of his lands by strip mining. Yeah, right. it it went cleanly. It's okay. But we're gonna see what so, happens with four generic it, there. Correct. Okay. You, you, you strip mine the island in response. Parker taps the island and floats a blue mana. He's allowed to do that. First in, last out. Although the stack wasn't really a thing like that. Uh, that's it. Yeah, <laughs> that's... Uh, so with the four extra mana floating, uh, I'm going to play a Talonos. Oh, he's got he's got Talonos's coffin. All right, that's a big deal right there. Obviously, the Triskelion needs counters, and he's going to have to uh, 
give forest walk twice to the same creature. Probably going to give forest walk, I imagine, to Triskelion. Because you want your opponent to block with the Suchi. But now there's a really difficult situation for Philippe. Because... Uh, Parker has the ability to add counters to the Triskelion. A lot of people think, oh, you can just use the Triskelion to fire off three arms and then regenerate the arms every turn with the coffin. But you can actually, the counters remain because the coffin treats the creature as being phased out. So you can actually pile up counters onto the Triskelion. You can give it three additional arms. So it's a six-arm Triskelion that's actually a 7-7. Seven, seven. Okay. Chad, are you still there? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. right. And uh, we've talked about that in some of the prior matches, how powerful Thanos Coffin is with Triskelion. Yeah, but just particularly the ability to just make an enormous creature out of it, a little bit underutilized, I think, a lot of the time. So he's got a Serendib Befreet, but he's definitely in a tight spot here. He can't attack, really. Well, I think, I guess he probably has to attack here anyway. Attack with something, even if that means that you trade. Yeah, he's sending him one, one Urnam. So Parker has the ability to just probably take this on the chin. He does not want to block with the Triskelion and lose it. Well, one of the things he, he could do is he could block with the Suchi, and with the four mana, he could put his Triskelion in the coffin and then get it back out in his upkeep. Yeah, not a bad idea, although it would come into play tapped. It would no. have more arms. He'd fire off one arm, and then it would come into play tapped yeah, that'd be as a 6-6. Six, 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 that'd be too much of a Which, would, which would make him pretty vulnerable. I mean, he could use the coffin to hold off four damage, but he would take another big chunk of damage. That, However, he would be at 18, or actually at 17, because he'd take one point of mana burn off the Suchi. I think that play actually makes quite a bit of sense. It's You're taking some damage in the short term, but it gives you more, more capability in the long term. Right. It looks like he didn't really spend a lot of time thinking about the option, but again, we don't know what's in his hand. As well, I don't know how many cards he's got. I think he probably has about maybe three cards left, three to four. And then Triskelion, for some reason, doesn't have counters on it. Oh, he's got those three cards underneath it to represent the counters. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, you're right. Yes, that's a good call. Thank you. Yeah, most people would just represent with a die, but I guess he's got the three Triskelion arm it's, cards. It's, it's driving me nuts that Philippe has his energy fluxes out as if they're in play. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, why are you? Yeah, doing that? a bit unusual, I would say. <laughs> so those are not in play, obviously. Do you, rec do you recognize anyone his, watching? Uh, he's, yeah, he's do you recognize the spellground? Yeah. Spellground. What's that? Do you recognize Philippe's spellground? No, I don't. Is that? That is that's Arthas, the Lich King from World of Warcraft. Oh, okay. I think it's basically from the the famous cinematic from Wrath of the Lich King the Expansion way back in 2008, right? Yeah, I think so. 2008. Best World of Warcraft expansion by far. Hmm. All right, so it looks like Triskelion's coming in. And he declined to block. A bit of an interesting choice. And he looks like he's going to transmute again here to go get another one, I imagine. And with the four mana, he can then coffin his Triskelion with three counters on it. Kind of a strange decision. Oh, that's right. He gave Forest Walk to it, of course. Yeah, that's why. Yeah. Remember, we did, we're we not able to hear which one has Forest Walk, but I mentioned before that it made more sense to give Forest Walk to the Triskelion since you want the guy to block with Suchi. Well, I got to say, those transmutes are really working overtime here. The whole yeah. package is kind of coming together well. And with the four additional mana he's got from the Suchi, he's going to take one point of mana burn, but then the, the Triskelion is going to go in the coffin and come back with six counters on it. He is going to get roughed up a bit here this one turn, though. Since he's fully tapped out and uh, and has just a 4-4 blocker against 11 power and attackers. So he'll give Forest Walk to that untapped Triskelion since it's the only one to play. He takes one point of damage and drops to 11. We should see the, the life total get adjusted over there. An unstable here would be pretty uncomfortable, though. Because that would, that would basically just force lethal. Let's we'll see what he's doing. The wolf. The mighty Wailuli. Interesting choice to cast a wolf pre-combat. I'm not sure I agree with that, given the fact that that's... Okay, there is unstable mutation. I don't know about casting the wolf unless he's he's basically baiting him with it and saying, go ahead and shoot this. He does have Pendlehaven, though. That's a very important part of this, because he can actually pump the wolf up to three. Yeah. So maybe he put it out there as an interesting little bluff to basically see, you know, maybe 
Parker doesn't see that he's got Pendlehaven. So instead of using one of those counters on the chumping Triskelion to shoot uh, to shoot Philippe, he fires at the wolf instead and allows him to just Pendlehaven it. So he takes less damage because this is lethal. He's going to have to chump here. We'll see what happens. How fortunate it is for for Phil that he had that unstable there to just yeah, very. It's huge because it's fourteen points of damage. It forces him to chump this turn. Yeah, and see him thinking about it. Obviously, there's no choice though because it is lethal. The question is, what do you do with the arms? I think he could fire off. The problem is that that Triskelion that's in the coffin is going to come into play tapped next turn. Mm. Which means he doesn't really have any block. He doesn't have any blockers and he doesn't have a workshop and no way to, I mean, he might have a hand with a millstone and a Jalem Tome in it, you know, totally useless in this matchup for the most part. They're very, very late game cards that uh, have no impact whatsoever in this tempo based aggro matchup. So there isn't really much of a choice here. I think the choice is just chump block and earn and fire off three arms straight at Philippe's face. Just leave the Wily Wolf alone since he can't really kill it anyway because of the Pendlehaven. He'd yeah. have to invest two arms in killing it and deal just one point of damage. But maybe that's better just to get rid of a chump blocker since he can't even come close to killing him anyway. I don't really see how Parker gets out of this just knowing knowing what's in the deck. Yeah, I think the I think the decision to attack with the Triskelion was probably wrong. Hmm. Even though it had Forest Walk, it just it doesn't really get you further ahead. You know, like what are you accomplishing by attacking? You sure you take the guy down to eleven, but you're not going to be able to finish him. He's going to be able to deal three points of damage with those arms at max, and then fire off uh, six additional arms. That's nine total, and take him down to two. Well, I guess it is pretty close. You take him down to two, and then you take one point of damage from the Serend of Afrit. And be at one, but it would not be quite enough. I guess if he has another Triskelion in hand, so he's going to fire off all three arms into Philippe's face. Philippe drops to eight life. It's not going to be quite enough. But he could potentially win the game here if he... Uh, he could potentially win the game here if he uh, is able to cast another Triskelion. But he'd need a workshop to do it. And the chances that he's got a Triskelion hand, actually, they're not that, they're not honestly not that low because both of those Triskelions came into play from Transmute Artifacts. So he actually has reasonable odds of having another one in his hand and could potentially win this game with a, uh, okay, I don't know why the Triskelion is untapped. It should come into play tapped from the coffin. But it does have six arms also. So he could win the game here with Workshop into Triskelion. A little bit of poor bookkeeping, I think, going on right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the Triskelion should be tapped. I mean, he's playing with Taunus's Coffin. It clearly says it enters the battlefield tapped, and it should have six arms, too, and not just three. So the game's actually a lot closer than I think Parker thinks. He's dealing one to what? To the wolf? What is happening here? He pumps it with Wiley. He's going to shoot it again. I'll shoot it again. Let me turn up the volume. Okay. Yeah. So we... So it's it's still a 1-1 one, one before that resolves. It's the, yeah, it's it the, dies from the second arm. He better not try to attack with the Triskelion. No, it okay, so okay, okay, it again, so and it's tapped. Pump it. Okay. Uh, and it's tapped. I, I, play, I played it this turn. I can't. Yeah, yeah. So it it then dies. Yeah. Uh, so I have four counters on Trike. Don't attack with that, please. Uh, but it's still summoning sick. Right, and it's tapped also. Uh, shit. Yeah, you got it. That's it. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Well played. Yeah, it can't uh, attack. Okay, right. Oh shit! But like, no. Jesus no. Christ! If he had, yeah, if he had, if he had untapped that thing after releasing it from the coffin and attacked with it, I would have lost my mind. But I'm glad that that <laughs> didn't happen. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So, despite the uh, turn two sitting in a bottle that killed an, an Arabian's card on the way out, uh, Philippe manages to take game one as expected. They're going to go to the sideboards, and you notice right away Philippe gathering up the four ominous energy flux and putting them straight into his deck. Of course. Alongside, most certainly, that crumble as well. And I don't imagine, I'm going to bring up the decks real quick here while they're shuffling. I don't imagine that Philippe's going to find much else in his sideboard that he needs here. He's got an, uh, 
enchantment alteration for some reason. I guess that's a little neat combat trick with his unstables. He's got a boomerang, not really useful. Concordant, certainly not useful. It's probably in there mainly to deal with uh, the abyss. And uh, he's got a Feldon's cane. No idea why that's in there. Two Winter Blast, three copies of Flash Flood, or four copies of Flash Flood. This is another example of where there's just some random cards in the sideboard that don't really make any sense. I don't really know what he would sideboard a single boomerang in or the uh, enchantment alteration. And as far as good options for sideboard in blue, um, some of the best cards you can probably run in this archetype are, or really any archetype, are a mixture of Old Men of the Sea against aggro and Time Elementals against control. They're kind of on the opposite ends of the spectrum of utility against those two archetypes, which are very, very common. And, uh, and you can get a lot of mileage out, out of both effects. And then as far as Parker's sideboarding is concerned, we've already talked about this before, Dan Dan unlikely to really matter because it's not a, it's not a battle on the ground. And uh, remove Soul just... I mean, he did get his ass kicked by Ernoms that game and a Serendib, so maybe he is going to be eyeing those remove Soul. And in fact, I wouldn't be too surprised if he brought him in. Uh, Chad, what do you think he'd pull if you were to bring in the four flash counters and four, uh, four remove Soul? What would he pull out? Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, obviously, he needs to pull out the Relic Barriers and the Millstones. Um, those are completely useless six cards. Uh, he probably should pull out two of the Jaloom Tomes and uh, maybe even one of the Recalls. And that would be, let's see, three, three, two, and one. So that'd be nine cards. He could put in the four Remove Souls, uh, the four Flash Counters and maybe one dan dan yeah maybe one dan dan i mean i you got to just question right is is dan dan better than jalem tome in this matchup i'd imagine that it probably actually is well you can block and, with it in combination with the triskelion that's what yeah exactly and if you just lost if you just lost some games to earn on Jin, you might be looking at the dan dan and thinking well it's better than nothing it's yeah not especially gonna... since he's got wailuli wolf so you know he can pump his Ernum even or pump his serendib or whoever yeah yeah, maybe he will. Uh, it, it is a little tricky to cast, though. I mean, it is double blue, and he's not running a ton of islands, although the Felwar Stones do provide blue mana most of the time, too. So, uh, But in terms of actual islands, it looks like he's only playing it looks like nine nine islands plus the, the four Felwars. He could, he could very well be in a situation where he did not have double blue for a while, and uh, looking at a handful of Dandans that you can't cast feels pretty bad. Yeah, but I, I think I think Parker, if, if Parker was going to win a game, I think he really needed to win that first game, and he got he got pretty close to it by having starting out with City in a Bottle in his opening draw, but he never got one of the three recalls to get it back, which of course would have swung that game in his favor in an instant. Yeah, and, I think uh, he's going to really be on the back foot here, Brian. I think what you pointed out earlier is dropping that City in a Bottle on turn two was a huge mistake. I mean. He could have had two, three, maybe even four Arabian Nights cards, right? Let's say he's got a he's got a Flying Man and a City of Brass and an Urnum and a Waluli Wolf, and you could have taken it all out later. Um, but he, you know, I think he thought he could get ahead by dropping it early and preventing um, preventing Phil from playing those cards, and Phil had that you know crumble right on time. Yeah, he had a mana drain too, and I think with mana drain sitting in a bottle, I'm definitely thinking about holding it and waiting for my opponent to overextend so that I at least get three for one, maybe even four for one with it. Yeah. Because Phil has no way to win the game if there's a city in a bottle in play. So you've got to make sure that you both play it and protect it. And uh, and even if that means you have to soak up 8, 10, 12, 14 damage in order to make sure that you put it into play and you win the game with it, it doesn't even matter because Phil has no reach. This is kind of something that was was a, a really common strategy uh, when I played the deck way back in the, in the mid 90s and the use of the card moat, which was um, preceded the abyss. And so many of the matches would come down to just getting moat and protecting it, that it often made sense to just wait until you could both play moat and protect it multiple times before you played it, even if it meant you had to go down to two to three life and you'd be rewarded for your patience. The guy would have you at two, but he could not finish you because he had no way to get past moat and uh, and Parker should have recognized that. I mean, maybe he was just expecting to draw into recall to get it back and just kind of wanted to to kill the the flying man. But one damage a turn isn't consequential. The guy might even throw a mutation or two on it on the next turn and you get him three for one that way. Yeah. So I, I agree with you. Very, very impulsive. It seemed powerful at the time, but clearly came back and, and bit him in the ass. Well, I also don't know if Parker looked at Phil's deck. I mean, this was our second tournament. We know did that. You, yeah. Did you publish the list in advance? You must have. 
Yeah, we, we've always done that. After the quarterfinals, we publish the top eight decks. So um, we've always shared the decks. But as you've seen in some of the other tournaments, people don't always have time to look and and do the research. So yeah, that's true. Apart yeah, from many important things to do. Yeah, I mean, if you if you got the time to do it, you know, when you got family and kids and this and this and that, some some folks have time to do it. Some folks don't. Some folks make the time. <laughs> Some folks are more disciplined, some are less. So I don't know if if Parker took the time to look, but certainly he knows he's got those crumbles in now and he'll be more careful. Yeah, well, just as a general strategy though, just understanding that if you know the format, right? If the guy's playing blue-green, you know that he doesn't have any direct damage. The only card he could probably have is uh, Psychic Purge. And so your life, recognizing that, you should realize that your life total doesn't really matter in this matchup very much. It matters so much more um, whether or not you just have the board under control. Looks like Philippe might be mulliganing here. And I think Chad, uh, I'm sorry, Parker is probably keeping his hand. Yeah. All right, let's see what happens. We've got quite the audience here watching this finals tournament two match as well. All the folks on the right-hand side there. Yeah, we've got Michael and Nick there too. All right, here it goes. Looks like he's drawn his seven again. Perhaps also uh, Philippe recognizing just how potent energy flux is in the match may actually even be mulliganing into energy flux, knowing that his opponent has absolutely no way to remove it. The only answer that uh, that Parker has against the card is a mana drain. Yeah. So looks, like they're, looks like they're both going to be keeping, and I assume Parker's going to be kicking it off. Yeah, the old aggressive mulliganing strategy that someone we know has has talked a great deal about. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> All right, turn one, turn one factory. That is an important card to have, actually, particularly as it. All right, flying man again. Well, so it'll be interesting to see when the city in a bottle makes an appearance. Whether or not Parker's learned from his mistakes last game. But the factory is. Factory is good. It does at least give him some pressure against uh, against an energy flux. If he's able to get uh, Philippe down fairly low and he's pressuring with factories, Philippe might be in a position where he can't even cast energy flux because he needs to keep mana up to deal with multiple attacking factories. You can see Parker considering something here. Yeah, he's really and taking he, his time here. Yeah. He's going to play an island. I like to decide whether or not to attack for two or cast a Felwar Stone. Oh, Millstone. Oh, that's devastating. Hmm. I wonder why he put those in. What, what on earth will Fleep do against that? <laughs> I guess he'll attack for one. Yeah, I'm really surprised that Parker left those in. Yeah, it was just awful. All right, so second island comes down. That means Philippe representing Mana Drain Mana. He does have four copies of Mana Drain. Yeah, I would imagine that attacking for two damage is a lot more valuable than casting Millstone if you're going to do anything with your two mana. I mean, what are the odds that the Millstone is decisive in any way? The card literally does nothing until you kill your opponent with it. So it's basically, it does zero. It's kind of like a weird version of poison. It's only... Except, that, it's, except that it's, it requires it's, 20, twice, 20 poison counters instead of 10. It's only useful in the Four Horsemen format when you come up against these control decks with no, these longer games where you can just run them out of cards. Yeah, exactly. And, and even then, Time on Metal is just so much better if you're playing blue. All right, he's going to strip mine one of the islands. Kind of an interesting choice also, given the fact that um, you might want to wait around to see whether or not the guy has green mana. And is this an attack? Okay, good. That's correct. <laughs> attack for two instead of milling for zero. It's for zero damage. Life totals are 19 to 18. Philippe should be at uh, should be at 16, but not too important right now. So another island comes down, and he's going to attack for one. It's be interesting to see. This may just be one of these weird games. Um, of course, we introduced dual lands into the format uh, starting on turn four, but one of the big problems with four horsemen format is the lack of overall dual lands. In fact, even though he's running a two color deck, Philippe did run a pair of cities of brass just for a little bit of mana consistency because of this exact situation, just no access to green at all right now. Oh boy, workshop's down now. And it's going to make things interesting. But of course, 
uh, Parker is looking at double blue, so he has to always consider that mana drain is looming there, and he can't just run out a six mana threat into it right away. He's probably just going to elect to attack for two here again. Yep, bonk. Down to 16. That kills a lot faster than a flying man. Let's see if he gets a forest. And uh, it's another island, so still no green mana, but he would be able to play a Serendipifreet here. Attacks for one. Serendipifreet. So it'll be interesting. Another reason to play Millstone is that sort of telegraphs to me that Parker is holding on to a transmute artifact, which means if he draws an island here, he could transmute the Millstone right away into a uh, into a sitting in a bottle. And this would probably be a decent time to do it. Or he could just cast a six drop too that would that would hold down the board. That's uh, going to be sitting in a bottle for sure, then. And you can see Philippe already picking up his two Arabian's creatures, and he has no green mana, so he cannot crumble it away. Could play an Energy Flux here, though, which would be pretty powerful. And would slow uh, Parker's progress down to a crawl. You see him sitting there dejectedly, shifting yep. around in his chair. Now, here's where, here's where if I were Parker, holding on to that strip mine might have been a, a better play i mean it's absolutely yeah again you just you, you don't just kill one of the guy's two islands you have no idea what the rest of his hand is let the game progress and, yeah. and develop a little bit and see what his mana is like because obviously being able to kill sure he might draw a green but if you kill that forest now there's one less forest in his deck yeah and uh he's even further away from casting the rest of the green cards in his hand uh, rest of the green cards in his hand all right double workshop he's going to throw out triskelion Hopefully, Philippe at least has a mana drain for that. Oh, he just passed. Did not attack. So now he's got Triskelion in play. Two blew up, for almost certainly for either Flash Counter or Mana Drain. He did finally draw a Forest. There's no way to interact with anything on the board, though, until he gets rid of that City in the Bottle. There's no blocking the Triskelion at all. And he's... Oh, he's casting Remove Soul. Okay, so he did have a counter spell for it. But Parker could counter back with Mana Drain. Looks like he's going to. Mm. Yeah. And I, I I definitely agree with this play, I think. I think this play makes perfect sense to do it. I think you just try to apply pressure right now when, you, when you've got the guy screwed over by his... Um, uh, no, that was not legal. And assuming that he's... Oh, okay, I guess... He, he didn't attack with the factory, did he? No. Well, where did the mana drain? I guess he just sank the mana drain mana into the into the factory. The factory, right? So he would have got it post combat, yeah. Although, again, in ninety four rules, he would have gotten on the next turn since there weren't two main phases. But this is an attack for six anyway. It's going to smash uh, Philippe down to just eight life. And all he can do is anemically throw out a elves of deep shadow, loses forest. Mm. Triskelion will slaughter no, the Deep Shadow. It's just going to have to chump block here anyway. And he's playing, okay, this game's over. There's mm -hmm. just no way. Did not draw Energy Flux. And got the game Parker. Philippe, Strip mine. Yeah, Philippe will scoop, scoop it up. All right, so just like that, Parker draws an overwhelmingly strong hand. Everything's synergizing perfectly while his opponent, Philippe, was stumbling on green mana. And they are off to game three. It'll be interesting to see whether or not um, Parker elects to keep those millstones in. I'm going to go back and look at his deck. I mean, we talked about how he was certainly going to be cutting at least the Relic Barriers. And uh, and I think, I mean, I think if I were him, I cut Millstone and Relic Barrier, and I certainly I leave the Jalem, some number of Jalem Tomes in if I'm planning on transmuting them, because they, they at least cost three mana. So if you transmute a Jalem Tome, it's it, you need less mana in order to cast something like a Suchi or a Triskelion. Looks like they're sideboarding. Chad, do you mind jumping ahead while they're shuffling? Sure. All right. Still a little bit of shuffling going on here. And it looks like Philippe is already already has his opening seven. That makes me think that Chad or Parker may have been mulliganing this time. That's a good place to start right there. And we'll see. Parker assessing. We'll see whether or not he actually really mulliganed. If he throws anything on the bottom of his deck. Oh, is that an actual another mulligan? That's pretty rough. 
Yeah, assuming, well, we don't know if that's the first or the second mulligan because we were fast forwarding, but you may want to jump ahead a little bit here. Maybe well, and Parker there. may be mulliganing to try to get a transmute or a city. Yeah, I can't imagine that. That's, that's a great strategy. Okay, so he did mulligan one card there. It looks like he is keeping this next hand of seven and Philippe leads with an island. This time, no flying man. All right, I don't know how many cards um, Parker has in hand playing a single island. These decks don't really have much, or at least Parker's deck doesn't have anything to do for one. All right, he plays a strip mine and passes. Interesting choice. I wonder if that means that he's got a handful of strip mines or no more land. I guess we'll see. All right. Does Philippe have a third land? And he does. Down comes Flux. And there's no way that Parker can stop that. Nothing that could stop it. Remove Soul would have worked on a creature. Now Flux is in play. So we're going to see what happens when Energy Flux is in play against Parker's deck. And that may not be the, the only Energy Flux we see this game. There might be a second one, too. I guess he can attack for two. Or we can elect to keep two blue mana up here. Yeah, I don't like this attack at all. You're not going to win with a factory with factory attacks because there's already a strip mine in play. And now you're letting your guard down. If the guy's got another energy flux, he can just cast it here with no thought. Doesn't have to worry about it getting mana drained. Uh, well, he's got another land anyway. Or if there's he drops no a quest, he can play and earn him. No green, yeah. And he's got his, uh, a strip mine untapped to deal with the factory if he decides to activate it. I like that play too. A lot of people would have just killed the factory right away, and I like the idea of waiting. Get the guy to commit the extra blue mana first, because you don't need to strip mine it. All right, so he's coming in. Yeah, he's going to get in, get rid of it now. I think this play is fine. Better than taking two over and over again, because if you do get too low, he can still burn you out with Triskelions, even with uh, energy fluxes in play. There's a second one. Yeah, God, it's so devastating. That's the reason why you don't attack. And it's the reason why you don't attack. Although he did have strip mine, so he could just kill the island anyway and then play the energy flux. But at least you force him to make that play rather than just tapping out. All right, well, he's got all the time in the world now. Uh, yeah, Parker can't even play anything. Still four islands. No force again. But, I mean, how is Parker... What does he even do this game? I guess there's that. <laughs> deal, uh, deal 18 points of damage with a factory while your opponent fails to draw green mana for every for a million turns. I mean, crazier things have happened. I can see him looking at his islands. He does have four Serendib Afrites and two Serendib Jins that can come down at any point in time. But he's going to be taking two points for a little while. Yeah, at this point, if you're Parker, you're just... I mean, you're on, it's a wing and a prayer, right? There's no other option but to just hope the factory gets there and your opponent just draws literally nothing for six or seven turns. If you can get, if you can get him down to like six life, then winning with Triskelions in a long game suddenly becomes a possible thing. Yeah, we're not going to see that come into play. But as soon as Philippe draws a green, I imagine this game ends. Island number five. So frustrating, I'm sure, for Philippe. We've all been there. We've all been there. I mean, this is why we added dual lands to the format. It's just ridiculous. Yeah. One of the many reasons why they needed to be in the format. Not being able to cast your spells because of this random RNG really sucks. All right, 14. He needs about six. He needs about, I would guess, four more hits with that to make this a game. We'll see if he can fade for us for four more turns. Or any green or any blue creature. Oh, I was just strip mine. All right, the party's over. <laughs> Sorry. There's just too many outs, really. Any forest, any strip mine, even a Serendib, a Freed, or a Serendib Jin, and it puts the brakes on the situation, and it's basically just over. Yeah, it's coming in. I'm certainly strip mine it. I agree with that too. No reason to take any more damage because it's literally the only way he can beat you. No green mana still, no blue flyers, nothing. It's kind of hilarious, actually. And discards a Jalem Tome. That was weird. I guess he passed for like, what's going on there? Okay, so he, he was just resolving the discard. I'm not sure why he discarded on his opponent's turn. Oh, poor Parker. 
Poor Parker. This time the two energy flux sitting in play are actually real. <laughs> Suchi goes to the graveyard. I, I don't even know why Parker would continue. It's just, there's no outs. This, this game could go on. Oh, yeah, there's a green mana. This game could go on for another dozen turns and it would be basically the same. You can't beat two energy fluxes with the way that his deck is set up. It's totally impossible. I mean, great. He could mana drain this, right? And he probably has to. So he mana drains it and does what? Plays a Triskelion and deals three points of damage. He can't even do anything with Mirror. There's just no, there's nothing that can be done here. I guess he could play a, he could play a Suchi and then pay the two mana each turn. No, you can't. It's four mana. Ugh. He's at negative <laughs> two. He's at negative two mana. Oh my god. Yeah. And as much as he'd love to strip mine the uh, to strip mine the forest. Yeah, I think that I do kind of think that Philippe probably has too many islands in his deck and not enough green. Because he elected not to run with Mishra's factories, even though his deck is super aggressive. What's going on here? Is, is he gonna cast Belmar Stone? You can't cast anything. Dan Dan. Oh, okay. No, what are you mana draining that for? Okay, you remove soul. Okay, fine. He doesn't want to take three. I suppose that's not terrible. Yeah, Dan Dan would have been all right there, huh? Yeah, wouldn't have been. I mean, his, he's got a handful of green monsters, though, for sure. Yeah, I don't think I cast anything there at all. I mean, you got to just, like, mana drain again, perhaps? Or at least threaten it why luli wolf that might be enough <laughs> that single why luli wolf might be might be decisive all right he's got another green mana anyway does he got does he have another creature in here another urn on god his whole hand must just be crumbles and stuff honestly i don't i don't know i mean maybe they know their decks i don't think i would have removed soul on the triskelion it's three points of damage who cares it's just a lightning bolt and you're still at 14. Are you still at 11? He's got to think about what to throw in the graveyard here. In a turn. All right, Elves of Deep Shadow comes down. Bigger wolf. He's <laughs> mana draining the <laughs> he owns the Elf mutation. I mean, I kind of get it. It's six points of damage, so. Oh, he's got another one. Oh my God. Yeah, I mean, the, the, what can he do though, right? There's, there's nothing that a deck can do, like uh, that this kind of a deck can do against even one energy flux, much less two. Maybe Parker, no should have ran, maybe Parker should have ran four, four spikes in his sideboard. I mean, something, yeah, certainly. I mean, it's just a, it's a problem that's kind of endemic to the format, right? There's just a lack of interaction on the stack. You just narrow solutions to things and enchantments in general in, in Four Horsemen are just too strong because the format doesn't have a disenchant and no tranquility either. No Niven Rolls disc. There's just no way to get rid of enchantments in a lot of these archetypes. All right, an island comes down. He's got four mana, which means that he can pay upkeep on an artifact creature now. So he could run out of Suchi or something here. Well, Brian, that's not entirely true. We do have Desert Twister. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Desert Twister, you're right. All right, so he's thrown out a Millstone. I guess he's going to transmute it. He could transmute it into a... What? Okay. He, I'm not sure what's going on here. Did he pass priority? He plays Millstone. It looked like he was thinking about transmuting. And I see Philippe cast a crumble right now. So that means that he had to have yielded priority. Rather than transmuting it. Why would he cast Millstone? Why? It, it's uh, Parker's priority or whatever he wants. Okay. As soon as Parker gives you priority, then you can crumble. Okay, yeah, so they're discussing the prior passing a priority here. You can't just crumble the thing before uh, the guy can do anything. So then actually, as... Can he respond to a, a transmute at the point then? No, you can't. Sacking it is part of the cost. Yes, so so you if cannot. you transmute, he, he can't. He can't inter he can't interfere with that. Okay. Like this is one of the reasons like he can't do what he just tried to do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'm glad that they got that correct. The so sacking it is part oh, of the effect. Uh, if you, if you, sacrifice you, is part of the effect. Oh, it's not a targeted thing. It doesn't say text is like it doesn't say destroy target artifact you control. 
It says sacrifice an artifact you control, and it's part of the cost. In response, cast the. But I don't know why it was built before, but right now Actually, I. You might be right. Let me let me read transmute. Yeah, because yeah, right. it's different than tinker. Yeah, tinker is like it's part of the cost. And so is transmute. It's just like tinker. All right. Well, I'll let them. I'll let them resolve this for a bit. Complicated thing. And so, so, Billy, so you're trying to, in well, response to Millstone being cast. Well, you're trying we, to. We establish, we establish that I, I don't have priority to respond to the Millstone, but in response to the the transmit artifact, if the sacrificing of the artifact is part of the effect of the card, I can respond when he casts it. So if it does, the transmute would fizzle. But if it's if the sacrificing is part of the cost of the card, I cannot respond because as he casts the card, he's sacrificing it. He is correct about that, but the card sacking is part of the cost. The millstone, you, you can play an instant at the point of him casting the millstone. Yeah, but it, target. he can't target. It's not in play yet. Before it's in play, so since it's it's his turn, I I think uh, uh, Nick is right. I, I or Michael, I'm not sure who's play, who's talking. Yeah, Michael. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, uh, transmute artifact is a sorcery, right? Chad, can right. we fast forward so, past this? So, there's, no, there's no debate here. Hopefully, it just arbitrated the correct way. Sacrificing the artifact is part of the cost of transmute artifact. It's just like Tinker. So you don't, you shouldn't even. The way he should cast this properly is put the millstone in the graveyard, tap two blue mana, cast transmute artifact. That's how it actually works. So there's nothing in play to destroy with crumble. Had they represented it correctly. So you gain two life, uh, Parker. Okay. No. Yeah, it like does not. That is wrong. Play it too around the fact knowing that you have trend or you have the crumble because. Yeah. Of uh, but Brian, I think what's going on here is. Um, what what Philippe was saying was he suspected that Parker would try to transmute and to prevent him from doing so in response to him casting uh, uh, Millstone and Millstone's in play he's playing an instant the crumble to crumble it so that he cannot transmute it oh actually you know what I it looks like I might be wrong anyway I'm looking at the rulings on the card it's very vague and on the, in 2011, it said the sacrifice of an artifact is an effect of the spell and not a cost, which means it happens as the spell resolves. If transmute artifact is countered, you do not have to sacrifice the artifact. Okay, so it looks like my assessment was incorrect. And but, but that was the correct this, interaction after all. But in this case, Brian, what, what Phil is doing is as soon as the millstone comes into play, He's playing an instant in response to. He cannot do that. He cannot do that, Chad. That's oh. not how priority works. Okay. Well, that's what he's trying to do. He tried to do that initially, and then he was backed up because of the fact that if you don't, as long as Chad doesn't, I'm sorry, as long as Parker doesn't pass priority, he can take the next action. So he can cast the transmute before Philippe has any opportunity to cast anything. Okay. The only, Philippe can respond with the, uh, the millstone on the stack. If there was some other target to crumble, which there isn't, once it's in play, it's Parker's priority again, and he has to yield priority before Philippe can cast it. But yielding priority happens when he casts the transmute artifact. And since, based on that ruling, because it's very vague on the card, and it's, I guess, not like Tinker, you actually need to have the card resolve in order to sacrifice something. So you basically cast transmute artifact, it's on the stack. And your opponent can respond with the crumble by crumble. removing. Well, if you only have one artifact in play, your your opponent can respond by destroying it. Yeah. But if there's two artifacts in play, he could kill one of them, but then you could sack the other one because it's not you don't declare what you're sacking until resolution. Ah, it's magic good. rules. It's just like casting recall. You say I'm going to cast recall for three, and then if it resolves, then you declare it, then you remove the cards from your hand, but you don't have to set the cards aside until you're actually resolving the spell. That's also different from the way the ruling used to be. All right, so he's going to cast a Suchi here as a temporary jump blocker. I guess, yeah, I guess he'll, it will hold down the fort a little bit, I suppose, because the Wailulu Wolf is going to shrink down to just a 2-2. Two -two. Or maybe a 3-3. Three -three. Yeah, no, he cast an unstable, yeah. So the last turn, 
The turn he casts the Elves of Deep Shadow, he's crumbling it right now. So he's going to deal four points of damage to his face there and attack for four more. That's going to be an eight-point hit. A little pug wanders by the battlefield. <laughs> yeah. All right, so four points coming in. He's taking four points of mana burn. It's eight total. Uh, no, you take four points of mana burn there. What happened? He did not take... Oh, he gains four life. Duh. Yeah, so it's, it's a wash against... When it's crumble, it kills Suchi, at least. Because you gain life off the crumble. It's not... Uh, well, Nature's Claim is pretty similar. All right, Workshop comes down. Well, he could he could just run out Triskelion here and just mow down these creatures to buy himself some time. Yeah, it looks like what's going to happen here, assuming that's Triskelion. Yeah. Well, pretty big draw there. This is... Oh, Philippe's got a counter for it, though, I think. Yeah, he's got mana drained. But if he doesn't have anything to spend that mana that mana on, he could be taking a ton of damage. He could be taking six. That is something to consider. You have to always be thinking, when you're playing against these shops decks with mana drain and four horsemen, you've got to always be thinking, yeah, so it looks like he does take six points of mana burn. Ow. Yeah, you got to be thinking, can I spend the six? So he trades three damage, deals, takes six himself, passes the turn back. This is why I think that that, that play earlier, remember when he cast Remove Soul on the Triskelion to avoid taking three? I think that was really impulsive and he should not have done that hmm. because it was only three points of damage. There were two fluxes in play, so the Triskelion could only deal three points of damage. And now he just took six later on by having to Mana Drain it and had to use Mana Drain on something over Remove Soul. When, when uh, Mana Drain can do something a lot better. Well, he's got enough mana to upkeep the Suchi, and the life totals are actually pretty close, 7 to 8. Yeah, I really, really don't, didn't like the play when Philippe uh, cast Remove Soul on the Triskelion. I like it a lot less now. Because right now, he's kind of... Honestly, it's 2 damage for 4, which means that, that uh, Parker actually wins the race. you got to give credit to Parker here for hanging in there. Yeah, uh, he, is, he is hanging in there. And if he's got a, if he's got a way to counter this Urnum... No, he yep. does not have a way to counter it because he kept millstones in. I don't think he brought in removed soul. We haven't seen Yeah, it. I was just going to say that. He must not have brought in those removed souls. He, I don't know why he kept those damn millstones in there. It's really frustrating. Yeah, what's interesting here actually is that uh, Parker still wins this game because he has to give he has to give uh, Forest Walk to the Suchi. He'll, he'll, and uh, because Philippe did not have another creature that turn, he can't represent lethal here. Right now, if Parker attacks for four, on or on the following turn, Jalen Tome, and another transmute perhaps? Oh no, he's paying upkeep, that's right. Why would he cast Jalen Tome? It just dies. Alright, so he gives Forest Walk to Suchi. Well, I guess he's just gonna he's just gonna send in Ernon. Yeah, I forgot about him having to pay upkeep. If he, he has no way to summon another blocker. I was thinking he could play another blocker and uh, and then hit for four, hit for four using Forest Walk. But Urnum's coming in, pretty much has to take it, but there's just, there's no way out against Energy Flux. You can only do one thing. He would need to he would need to be able to play a workshop and drop a Triskelion as a blocker. Yeah, where he could block and shoot down both the Elves of Deep Shadow. So that's, yeah, that's kind of the only out. He's thinking about whether or not to block here. I think, well, he does have the option to chump block, and he could take two points of mana burn and loot with the Jalem Tome, but that doesn't really get him any further. It's I think, you, yeah, you got to play to your outs. I think you, you basically, I, I don't know what's in his hand, but I do think you probably have to just take the four here. The only way you can possibly win is if you take four damage, you go to three, and then during upkeep, you pay four in your Suchi, you untap and you draw exactly workshop and have Triskelion in hand or vice versa. Yeah. At which point you play the Triskelion, you can block the Urnam Jin and fire off arms to kill the two one ones. Right. And then your Tsuchi goes the distance. That's the only way you can win. Yeah. So you have to take you have to take the four here. And he does. Good. But we'll see if Philippe has he can't and, stop and Philippe has to not have a mana drain or a removal. Or a removal, exactly. <laughs> which he's had a lot of those. He's had he's had him right on time every time. Yeah, so. he has, for sure. He's, but he's gone fairly far into his deck too. So having a pair of those 
Having a third, pretty unlikely, but he does have... He may also have just a crumble in hand as well. He's playing another creature. That's actually quite consequential. That changes everything. So now he now Triskelion is not an out because um, he won't be able to block the uh, the Serendip of Freed on the following turn. It will just kill him. He's got to pay upkeep here. I'll take put four mana in his pool and only be able to use two of it and go to one. And he's certainly thinking about it right now. You see, Philippe taps the two energy fluxes. Oh, is he going to let it die? That is not winning. I mean, there is no winning anyway, but that's less winning. You know what it is? Pro yeah, he can't even... I guess there is... Uh, so he's thinking about using this. Does this even work? Yeah, I guess you can actually do this. Because of the order of resolution, you can decline to pay. Although there was a rule actually a long time ago, if you're really being pedantic about 94 rules, there was a rule that said that you could not tap artifacts until you paid the upkeep on them for a while. I'm not sure when that was a rule, but that prevented you from, for example, using moxes to pay for themselves when energy flux was out. Hmm. So he's drawing with it. I, I see he's just letting it die. What are you? Okay, he's dead. Throws his hand in fury on the table, and that is the match as expected. All right, and Philippe becomes the Four Horsemen Tournament number two grand champion, riding the back of his blue-green aggro uh, aggro tempo deck to a uh, to a win against Parker. Congrats to both players. It was quite a match, actually. Kind of went about how we expected. Game two was definitely a demonstration of of Parker's deck, kind of drawing the 90, 95th percentile outcome and drawing exactly the right things. Kind of what I was saying before the match began that he could win the game if he drew exactly the right mixture of things. But uh, in the other two games, Philippe kind of, his deck just did what it needed to do. And of course, game three was just all energy flux. And that was more than enough to carry the day. So congratulations to Philippe, Four Horsemen, tournament number two, grand champion. Yeah, it was a good match. And, um, you know, this is the first time that uh, Parker has made it to the, uh, the, the, the finals. Um, Philippe, was rewarded with his uh, Ken Meyer Jr. Guardian Beast Purple Moonlight Clay Mat. We shipped him one of those, as we do with all of our winners. And that brings us to Four Horsemen Old School Magic Tournament number two finals completion. Congrats to Parker for his, his second place win. Congrats to uh, Philippe for his first place championship. Yeah, absolutely. Certainly, congrats to Parker as well for uh, for navigating to the finals. Came a little bit short, but it'll be interesting to see whether or not he decided to continue to iterate on that deck in the tournaments to come. We have a lot more Four Horsemen events uh, that have already transpired. I believe tournament number six has already concluded, so there's plenty of other stuff here. And if there's more interest in watching these videos and, and us doing commentary and covering them, please say so in the comments if you've enjoyed watching this. And uh, I was Pleasure joining you again for all these games, Chad, and uh, looking forward to doing more of it in the future. Thank you for joining us today for the Four Horsemen Old School Magic Tournament number two finals with Brian Weissman and the Chadster. We want to extend a special thank you to the supporters and the players of the Four Horsemen Old School Magic Players Group, and especially to those who participated in tournament number two. Congratulations to Philippe Bizien for taking his first place in this tournament with his blue-green skies aggro deck. And also congratulations to Paco Boad for his second place finish with his mono blue or workshops or robots deck. We welcome old school magic players to join us at fourhorsemanmagic.com. Here you can learn about our past tournaments and future events. Links to our Facebook, our YouTube blog, our calendar of our events, our rules, Etsy store, and more. Please join us today at fourhorsemanmagic.com. If you would like to play Four Horsemen Old School Magic, we welcome you to join us for our weekly Thursday night Battle Royale meetup. The Four Horsemen Old School Magic group meets every Thursday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on the Four Horsemen Facebook. 
which is facebook.com slash groups slash four horsemen mtg and we also leverage our whereby for virtual matches please join us for camaraderie conversation casual games and deck testing and as always proxies are allowed